Hello and welcome to climbingarbus.com. My name is Dan Holliday. In this video, I want to talk about specifically Douglas fir trees and why you shouldn't thin Douglas fir trees. So I'll get all, I'll get into all that information in this video. So I work in the Pacific Northwest and Douglas fir trees are a native tree to this area. So there are uh, tons and tons of Douglas fir trees and we work on a lot of them. Um, now Douglas fir trees are renowned for having major breakages of really long limbs and if this is in, in, in an urban environment this can be pretty damaging if like a 25-30 foot tree comes spearing down from 80 foot up and lands on your house, a car, a sidewalk, all this kind of stuff. So. Um, I came across some really valuable information um, in, on two separate occasions. One came from Julian Dunster, who a lot of you will know. He's highly involved in the ISA and he came up with the track um, process certification, all that kind of stuff. And another one, um, uh, Nick a friend of mine that I met in the Pacific Northwest, and uh, I think his surname is Dankus, but I'll I'll refer to some of his paperwork in this video as well, um, so I can confirm if that, if that was his surname. But anyway, uh, yeah, Nick put together um, a whole um, piece on pruning Douglas firs specifically and why you shouldn't thin Douglas fir trees. So a common thing that will happen on Douglas fir trees is that you'll get these really long limbs huge limbs so these like this one here is probably out from the trunk maybe 25 feet possibly even 30 feet and the same with these ones here now douglas fir branches are pretty brittle but they grow so long and so heavy that any like excessive movement in the wind like this you'll like these longest ones like this one down here, which is super long because it kind of comes down and swoops back up, they will um, blow in the wind like up and down and then they'll eventually like some of these bigger ones will snap out. So you'll always find it after high winds and Douglas fir trees will shed some limbs. Now what a lot of people, a lot of arborists and a lot of homeowners think is that you need to thin these kind of trees to allow wind through um, so they're, they're not as much as a, of a wind sail but if you look how dense this canopy is you've got all these like interior limbs and all the limbs are being so dense and creating this dense canopy mean that they act as like a bit of a, a dampener to each other so these larger limbs can't be kind of blowing the wind too much like this because they're getting, they have all these other branches around them where you start thinning out all of this growth. You know, you start making it nice and thin throughout here, letting the wind get through. And then these limbs can, can extend way more. They can blow way more and then they overextend and that's when they'll even, even more likely to snap. So thinning out Douglas fir trees is not a good idea. You want to keep them dense and you want to tip back the longer limbs to reduce that excess force. So tip back these, tip back this limb, tip back these ones here, tip back these ones here and make a more even kind of canopy like, like this all around. So you don't have these huge ones sticking out and that is what's going to create a safer mature Douglas fir tree that's going to reduce the risk of failure or limb snapping. So this is a job where we're just doing that end weight reduction to stop failure like I was explaining on these large mature Douglas fir trees. So you can see here we're probably taking off this one maybe like 8 to 10 feet from the ends of all these long limbs that are probably a good 25 feet long at least. So we're just taking the, the longest ones and we're leaving 
any smaller lim smaller to medium sized limbs that are growing throughout the tree um, we're leaving those ones intact and we're just reducing back the the really long ones all around the canopy This is the Douglas fir that we pruned last year um, and we pruned it for the exact reason of taking in some like longer limbs all the way around so we've made the quite a, a nice even canopy so there's not any hugely protruding limbs out there but still looks quite natural so the whole point was to reduce the risk of limb failure snapping limbs in high winds or snow that kind of thing so you can see this is an example of you know pruning all those long limbs leaving like a natural but uniform shape to the uh, sides of the canopy so this is what i found on the internet just to back up um, my claims what i'd heard julian say in a course that he was running so this, e this is an email from Julian to somebody at the city of Surrey um, in British Columbia, British Columbia when they're asking about um, this type of pruning. So it's um, titled Spiral Pruning. And Julian says, In the lower mainland of BC, a few of us initiated spiral pruning as a technique to reduce the likelihood of wind throw in the early 90s. Initially, it was mainly Douglas firs, hemlocks and red cedars along, along the edges as new developments occurred. Later, it was tried on isolated trees. As an edge treatment for newly exposed trees in a forest, it works well. It opens up the edge to be more porous and the wind dissipates back into the forest stand without triggering wind through. As a treatment for individual trees, it is less successful and on Douglas fir, very harmful. When we started it over two decades back, we had heard little about branch clashing, wind cell, etc. And it seemed a logical approach. It turns out that at least in Douglas fir, the branches need to clash. When they were removed as part of spiral pruning, they moved a lot more in strong winds and increased branch failure resulted, which in turn allowed other branches to move more and encouraged additional branch failure. I recall seeing isolated Douglas firs that had been spiral pruned looking very mothy and years later with massive amounts of limbs broken off. The trees are not, uh, the trees not touched seemed fine and a few had fallen down and, f and few had fallen down. These days I would not prescribe spiral pruning for an individual tree that is isolated. I would still recommend it as part of an edge treatment for news, newly exposed trees in, in any species in forest conditions. It should not be prohibited in all circumstances. Like many treatments, there is a time and a place where it can be very effective as a means of meeting defined management goals. On so this is Nicholas Dankus' is, um, piece that he put together. And it's called Pacific Northwest Conifer Care Guidelines. And it's for techniques for large, healthy, evergreen trees. So you can see this is the, um, this first image on the front page is basically showing a tall, large Douglas fir tree um, that has these overextending limbs. And he's just put little red marks of the, of the limbs his, he suggests would be taken back in. To give like the the tree like a natural overall shape, a natural look, and keep that natural canopy, but keep it even and so that it's not there aren't these huge limbs sticking way beyond the the natural flow of the canopy, if that makes sense. So you see on the right hand side, there's this uh, long one like halfway down the canopy that really sticks out. And then there's a, you know, there's a few at the top that kind of stick out. There's a few at the t on the top left that stick out, and it's just like a, a good visual to, to just explain what it would mean to bring some back in. And obviously, on a picture, a tree always looks tiny, but this tree is measured at 115 feet tall. So this longest branch on the right hand side, and who knows, that could be 35, 40 feet long, um, and pretty large in diameter so you imagine like the force and the weight that that is putting on 
that branch at, near the main stem. Um, and then if we just scroll down and look on the second page, there's um, point number four. He is mitigation. And if you, if you look, read down to the second paragraph, it says pruning to limit the width of the tree for wind flow around, not through the canopy. Decrease leverage down the stem, reduce end weight on limbs, encourage exterior foliage regrowth, preserve, preserve interior epicormic growth, clean out major dead wood greater than one inch in diameter. And that's uh, Matic who said that is obviously taking that from a different publication. And then he, he puts the next paragraph says, seriously, thinning trees in, not out. So please thin highlighting the in part trees where necessary the terminology we would use is i'm going to thin it thin it out so he's he's focusing on the in like keep the interior <clears throat> so this is a house that we worked at and it's um, on quite a bit of a slope and you see the the top of the house has all these glass windows um, and it's got a flat roof and just behind those windows and to the left of those windows are some huge Douglas fir trees, about 170 feet tall. So we were asked to come in and reduce the, the hazard because right. some large limbs had fallen onto the roof. Luckily, no damage had been caused, but we reduced them back to prevent any risk of failure of large limbs in any heavy windstorms or under any heavy snow loading. So these are just a few clips of us reducing back the longest limbs that are most likely to fail. Just do what you've been doing already, it's been working out perfect. Yeah buddy! So to summarise, when it comes to Douglas fir trees, the best thing, especially for safety, is to reduce those long limbs, take off that end weight, but leave the interior foliage in the canopy as a cushioning both for the wind that blows through and a cushioning for the branches so they don't um, move about too much and overextend.